I've been researching on this community for quite a while and uh, the work that I do is actually telling stories through photography and I just want to share with you, uh, for those of you who might know this community, uh, just share with you a quote when I met this retired Singapore girl girl when I was travelling and his quote really sparked something deep inside me to continue this. He said, he told me, when Chinese were beating Malays, Chinese, police, uh, Chinese policemen would let them continue. When Malays were beating Chinese, Malay policemen would carry on. Such a vivid historical account by someone so far away uh, to remember a very important part of Singapore's history, the 1964 racial riots between, especially between the Chinese and the Malays, is still so embedded in him that he's able to tell the story from top to bottom. Of course, he was witness uh, to this event. So, the work that I do is I decided that this is a community of people that are worth going after. And they are the Singapore Gurkhas. Who are they? They are this paramilitary force. When we talk about paramilitary, they are able to do both uh, specific duties of both army and uh, police. They are under the police contingent, Singapore Police Force, but they also are trained to do army-related stuff. And this is how they look like. This photograph was taken during the 2009 APEC summit uh, when President Barack Obama was visited Singapore. And you can see that they are loyal, steadfast, uh, and they are brave and totally disciplined. You can see their trademark uh, khaki brown broad rim hat and the kukri is placed at the back. Okay, so they have been here. Uh, their history has spans way back and I'm going to share that a bit more with the stories that I collect in the next few slides. And this is where they stay. All right, They stay off this barricaded compound of uh, Juseng Street, which is near Aljunit. And it is interesting whereby you see this community of people which are, I would call, visibly invisible. You see them uh, standing outside, uh, guarding ministerial res residences, especially 38 Oxley Road. How many of you know where there is? Okay, never mind, you all just laugh, we all know. So, uh, there's the residence of former Prime Minister, uh, Lee Kuan Yew. And this is where they stay. And it really picked in me this curiosity about what they do, uh, their stories, um, what goes on inside there. And after they are done, uh, after they have served for 27 years or until they are age 45, they have to go back to Kathmandu. And it is uh, repatriation, their family has to go back with them and a host of other issues uh, arise. But I will share with you later on. So we go to uh, some of the stories I collect. Uh, and this man, his number is 4088. His name is Mr. Bhakta Bahadur Guru. He's actually part of the original Gurkha contingent that came in 1949, April 9. That is their so-called founding day. And he has this really wealth of knowledge and experience in terms of remembering Singapore at its most uh, difficult history. Uh, it was the time of strikes, of riots, and his story was that of the Maria Hurtle riots which was in 1950. For the Maria Hurtle riots, for those of you who do not know, it's actually uh, where Malay and European communities, okay, they rioted because of this court ruling to give custody <coughs> of young Maria Hurtle to her biological Catholic parents. And he witnessed young Maria Hurtle traveling inside the car, looking reluctant to enter, to follow her biological parents. It was truly history coming alive for me. It was riveting. It was uh, really something which I did not expect from someone so far away. And funny thing is they also spoke in Malay, uh, the language of our forefathers, as in when we converse, our parents, as some of you might know, on the streets, Bazaar Malay, they'll talk to each other in this language. So he's holding on to his memorandum of service, which was about 10 years, and there's his tangible memory record of his service here. Then we move on to Mr. Tusi Prasad Guru. Uh, is someone I've known for very long and he is one who is interested in the politics of Singapore. The first thing he asked me is the new Prime Minister, the son of Lee Kuan Yew. Uh, and he remembers seeing young um, Lee Sien Leung running around, okay, around his uh, house 
in 30 Oxley Road. So he has all this deep memory. And for him, his biggest memory was of the 1959 uh, general elections. Obviously, you know, this year is the year of the elections, uh, presidential, both general elections also. And he was there, and he spoke of how there was this enthusiastic feeling in the air about how we have reached a state of self-governance. And he can go on and ask about what has happened to opposition leaders, so on and so forth. Mr. Prem Badu Limbu is number 7008. He is also a fascinating in individual where he talks about his experience in the 1969 racial riots, also known as the May 13 incident. For me, the biggest, for me, when I talk about the racial riots, I only think about the 1964 one, not the 1969, which actually happened in Malaysia. And it was such a big incident over there that it resulted in a state of emergency and suspension of government. But it has a spillover effect here, and he remembers this thing happening. And he's actually carrying his, a photograph of his father, who was serving here as the original member. And what's fascinating is he grew up as a boy here. And he went back to Nepal, he managed to get back here again. So he spent close to three quarters of his life here. So you can think about the feelings and the attachment that he has grown over here. Still, he has no choice but to be repatriated back. So what I did was, I did an anthology of portraits and anecdotes of the Singapore Gurkhas. All right? About 50 or so of them all have stories to share, all have something that they remember, tangible or otherwise. And it's my hope to create some sort of like a visual archive to remember this group of people who have served even before Singapore's independence, uh, which they belong to Singapore's colonial past. And in the second portrait, I got them to juxtapose themselves with a photograph of them in service, which I'm really proud of. They will have photographs of them in uniform, and they hang it proudly displayed all over there, all over their houses. So why photograph the Gurkhas? True photography, I feel, is a process of commemoration. Uh, there's this article written by a renowned Japanese photographer, Daido Moriyama, and he talks about how uh, he creates a document which he wants to crystallize it as a memory. Okay? And the process of photographing the Gur Gurkhas was something pretty emotional. They look at me, they look really stoic, and it was a really formal event for them. They did not move. I told them to smile, but uh, some of them don't have teeth, so it's a bit difficult to uh, put them on the best front, you see? But at the end of the day, it's about their stories. And I feel that their stories are stories which belong to us as well. And it is somewhat someone's duty to try to put it all together. And then we talk about history and nostalgia. Whenever they meet me, they'll be very quick to ask the development of Singapore, what has happened, what has changed. And you realize that we talk about nostalgia. I break it down, the meaning of the word nostalgia. In Greek, uh, it's nostos and algos. Nostos means a sense of returning home. Algos is this sense of aid. But what kind of home they return to? Uh, what is home to them? It's really quite subjective. And I take it further when we talk about nostalgia. Their nostalgia, okay, in, in the most intangible form, is through stories. Okay? They talk, they reminisce about old times. It's a very intangible form of memory and nostalgia. But a more tangible form is actually through old photographs, which I actually created. And I actually did a side project whereby I call it the Gurkha Memory Project. And what I did was, I took photographs. Uh, okay, like I was a bit nosy. I said, let me look through your old albums. I want to see if there's anything about old Singapore. And they gladly showed me, and we had a good conversation about all this. So this is them in uniform. Okay, you can see the old uniform and the new uniform. Man on the right, Mr. Chandra Badu Guru, looks very stylish there. Okay, and this is inside their camp in Mount Vernon. Okay, this is where uh, the children are singing the national anthem in their own inside school where they learn Nepali. On the right is a temple okay, uh, for them to do, to celebrate uh, their religious festivities. Here is the old photograph of them in Mount Vernon camp. This boy here eventually grew up to become a girlfriend. And that's his father right above him. Okay? Over here, anyone wants to hazard a guess where is this? Botanical gardens. Okay? So for them, it is very important that they go to certain specific places that help them remember about Singapore. Then I took it a step further, all right? And I realized that when you use photography, you can actually amplify it with social networks. When I published uh, The Invisible Force on newspapers, the effect wasn't really very good. 
what happened was that uh, it was published in a Nepali newspaper, but it didn't get picked up, maybe because it was in uh, textual form and things like that. But I realized that the moment I did this project using photography and published it through online publications, it kind of like went viral. And my sense is that the medium is such that it's visceral, that there is a certain emotion attached to it. And within Facebook itself, okay, a social network, um, everyone wanted to be involved. They started tagging themselves, and I'm having conversations with the diasporic Nepalese all around the world, from Cyprus, Hong Kong, uh, America. And they all come and converse with me and say, thank you for doing something like this. Are they forgotten? More often than not, when I meet the Gurkhas, they tell me very, very beautiful things about Singapore, but at the same time, there's a tinge of regret that they feel that perhaps more can be done for them or to be remembered. Because the moment they hang up the uniform, they kind of like sit inside. And I've been trying to figure out what are the reasons for this. And when I spoke to this uh, academic uh, who has been researching on the Gurkhas very uh, deeply also, and she said that as an impartial force, okay, their role uh, since the racial riots, their role is defined vis-a-vis -vis the major races here. So their role is to the point whereby they are just at the periphery, always at the periphery. So they remain on our historical margins never ever to be mainstream uh, because of what they do. And people often ask me what is my really main motivation sometimes and I go back to the children since we are talking about youth here. And these are all children who have been born and raised in Singapore and they realize that once they reach a certain age, they have to be repatriated back. And it's this feeling of uh, urban displacement from third world, from first world to third, you know, we have the memoirs from first world, from third world to first world, but for them it's a reverse, all right? And they're all holding mementos which are very important for them. For Sujita Gurung, she's holding on to her certificate whereby she was accepted to Ni An Polytechnic Mass Communications, but because of some difficulties with her visa, she decided, no, I'm just gonna go back and work. Uh, Prema, over here, she's holding on to her birth certificate. And for the first time I see there's actually a remark, this child is not, a citizen of Singapore at the time of birth. It's the first time I'm seeing it. Uh, and many other stories. So when I did this project, a lot of questions came to my mind and I talk about the big picture. And one of the few things that arose was actually about identity and being Singaporean. What does it mean to be Singaporean for all of you? Like, is it a matter of length, duration? Is 27 years enough? Is, uh, I don't know. There are a lot of things that came to my mind in terms of how do we position ourselves, how do we ask ourselves whether we are Singaporean or foreign in this debate of uh, foreign talent. Uh, are we future ready uh, in terms of being a multiracial society? Can we do without them in case of anything? And do we still need them in the future? These are some questions which I just throw out uh, and I decide that we should start a conversation about this and see where it leads to. And it's quite clear that these Gurkhas, which has uh, so much mystery around them, uh, there's very little literature actually on this community of people, except for this one small letter by Miss Jessica Fu Shui. She talked about her experience meeting Gurkhas in Canada and how they are disciplined, they are, you know, they are really a role model kind of season whereby they are law abiding. And she mentioned let Gurkhas become PR. But it's just a question which I just want to throw out to all of you. What I hope, like I said, is to create something like a visual archive. Their stay here has been over 60 years, even longer than Singapore's independence. And I was hoping that there's something that we can do to sort of like commemorate them, uh, like a form of heritage. This photograph is taken in Nepal, in Pokhara, a touristy state, whereby it's actually a Gurkha museum. And this small little corner uh, devoted to the Singapore Gurkhas, especially one photograph of President Wee Kim Wee uh, and a few others. So this is the form of commemoration that they get really far away. Perhaps we can do something here, perhaps a bit more. Let's let the conversation continue. And this is my hope eventually, to use photographs as a medium to advocate for a certain cause and that's what I do. So let's try to take the conversation a bit further and I hope you guys can join this Facebook page. So with that, thank you for your time.